Hello and welcome to another video and podcast from Fantasy Football Scout. My name is Joe and today I'm joined by Mark, aka the FPL General, to reveal his Game Week 7 team. Mark, welcome. How are you? I'm very well, Joe. It's uh, yeah, good to be back to another video. It's it's we're heading towards October now. It's quite cold in Scotland, so I've been uh, I've been mm. shivering the last couple of days. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks to thanks to somebody in a in a Chelsea shirt. It's been a it's been a it's been an okay game week. I'm actually just about on a small green arrow. Yeah, uh, it just kind of shows you what kind of game week it was. Even owning Cole Palmer, it's uh, it was a bit of a disaster across the board. It was indeed. I've got a red arrow, <laughs> so uh, no Cole Palmer. That's that's. I mean, there are differences between our squads, but the main one is no Cole Palmer. So if you if you haven't got a 25 point player in the game week uh that's huge but that's that's a, that's a you know it's a good thing to have him obviously i wish i did but because it's something in the memory now see i always remember frank lampard's 28 points was it something like that um or mo salah in a blank game week as captain getting another sort of 25 26 point haul so we'll always remember the and alexander arnold i think he's got he's got a couple of 21 points and Definitely got one against Leicester around yeah. Christmas time. Um, a Sharvin's four goals for Arsenal against Liverpool. Those who had him then. Defoe's five goals, I think it was. Um, and I think Berbatov may have got five as well. Yeah. And now Cole Palmer, four goals against Brighton. That's That goes down as an all-time great single game week uh, player score. So it's good, to, it's good to have them there. That's, I always say it's the, it's the memories. And that's a memory you could, you know, in 10 years time, you'll remember that. Yeah, exactly. And it's all of those you mentioned, um, good nostalgic memories. I think Lampard, I remember having a, a, a 50 point Lampard captain. So it must have been 25 as well. But uh, yeah, yeah, good memories. Yeah, I especially like that one because I had Drogba captain and he failed to play. And I was counting down the and I had Lampard as my vice captain. And he was racking up the goals. And I was like, oh my God, please, please do not um, bring Drogba on. Keep him on the bench. And so I remember that. And I'll always remember that. I don't know when that was, like 12 years ago, 10 years ago. Who knows? But going back a while for sure. We remember that as well. So what we're going to do here, we're going to look back on the game week six. We touched a bit about Cole Palmer being the main draw there. Um, we'll look at the fixtures the next six or seven game weeks. See where we're at. Um, Mark has asked me to have a look at um, the Fantasy Football Scout members area to have a look at some defender stats, particularly some decisions he might have around Arsenal and Man City defenders in a couple of weeks. Um, also, cheap strikers. Um, lots doing well. Perhaps we might want to change who we've got in our teams. Um, everyone's sort of got a cheap striker. They might like them. They might want to change them. And there's some ones, uh, particularly Wolves, who've got good fixtures on the horizon coming up at some point as well um before we do that just remember do press that like button does help us out and do remember to subscribe so you can be up to date with our latest videos and podcasts and um, do leave a lovely five star uh review for us on uh, if you're listening to this on the podcast version um okay let's have a look at how you did in game week six as you said um a good game week um well okay okay game week but made a really good game week because of Cole Palmer. So do you want to take us through your team? Um, we've got a nice 53 points, which is currently six above average at the moment. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk through the kind of how I ended up here on the wild card and stuff like that. But it, again, it just it just shows me, you know, how difficult the game week it was when I haven't even had a fantastic one. I'm just mm. about on a on a small green arrow. Mm. Semenyo's still to go, so hopefully he can fix that uh, on Monday night. But yeah, a, a difficult game week for many managers, whether they wildcarded or not. You know, very popular players not delivering. It's just FPL has been a bit bonkers over the last couple of weeks. But I think the main advice is always, you know, don't panic. You know, look at your team for game week seven, and mm -hmm. it's probably in pretty good shape. So going back to last week, the wild card, you know, like many others, it was ended up fairly template, but. All week, you know, good old gut feeling was I really wanted Cole Palmer. Uh, just, you know, mm. unbelievable player. I still think he's underrated maybe in the FPL community. To me, he's he is the new Salah, um, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of ceiling and stuff like that. He's just, he's incredible. So sacrifices had to be made. And, I, you know, I was looking at, you know, Luis Diaz and Solanke drafts, like many others, you know, ended up mm. on. I wanted, you know, Watkins had to be sacrificed. I even contemplated dropping Trent out. In the end, I just forced Cole Palmer in. Yeah. And one of the one of the downside was a weaker bench, for example, and also having to play Rogers every week. And I just settled on being happy to play Rogers every week. I think he's good enough. I think the fixtures were fine. And it allowed me then the Palmer Saka Haaland, you know, big three. Mm. And it just it, it felt right for me. 
Uh, I don't. I didn't really like the team structure. If I'm honest, I still don't really like the team structure. No. But overall, you know, I've got 25 points from Palmer, so it's it's paid off. So I moved mountains to get him in, and it was uh, you know very enjoyable. I was actually out in the mountain Saturday, mm -hmm. got a WhatsApp message through from my brother at half time to say he captained Palmer, so I knew it must have been good. Wow. Um, yeah, so it's Flecken in goal, Alexander-Arnold, uh, double Arsenal defence, Saliba and Gabriel for a grand total of one point. Uh, Palmer, 25 points. Saka, three points. It was five points, but um, last night he lost a couple of bonus. Um, Semenyo still to go. Uh, Brian and Bomo, nine points. That's standard. Uh, Rogers seven points. Calvert-Lewin, one point. And Harlan blank as a captain, but... 160% uh, uh, effective ownership there. So very well captains. Um, and then Mikalenko Greaves. I don't even know who this is as your, as your four, your third forward. Who is that? I had to, uh, I had to do some Googling on Friday as well. It was um, the plan all along was get Ross Stewart as the four, five, mm -hmm. four, but he went to 4.6 on over, I think it was Friday night. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's very few 4.5 million forwards left. There's only four. I think there's a Wheatley at Manchester United. Mm -hmm. There's a, a Lancashire at Tottenham. And I obviously didn't want those teams yeah. in case I won triple ups later. Mm -hmm. So Leon Chawomi is my oh. is my new is my new little little gem. Mm -hmm. uh, probably get zero minutes all season, wow. but yeah, just a fifteenth dead wow. spot on the bench. I, I look forward to him on loan to Cheltenham <laughs> by Christmas. <laughs> um and you've got um I missed out as well, Flecken's deputy um goalkeeper as well. So um you've got that. That double up there, Flecken is out as well. Um, just immediate thoughts, really, with the team. So you're not happy with the structure. I mean, I, I've gone for the more traditional 3-4-3. Three, three. I've got Havertz up front um, and Luis Diaz instead of that Palmer and uh, Chuomi. Um, but I'm 20 points less than you. <laughs> so immediately, that's not great. But, but it's weird, isn't it? I actually feel more comfortable with my team. <laughs> than I would be with, as you said, with your one because of that. But I just feel a bit more comfortable that I can hop on and off, even though I've, I'm doing much worse. And it's, it's weird. That's weird, isn't it? Yeah, because I think traditionally the old me, I say the old me, you know, I, I would have went down the Luis Diaz, Solanke price points, which mean you always talk about just yeah. to make future transfers yeah. easier. But again, it was just a very strong gut feeling. Uh, mm -hmm. Palmer, again, I just really wanted him. And, and I just made it work. And I think I had 0, 0.0 in the bank. I think it was 0. 0.1 million left mm. over. So I just forced him in again. I didn't want Luis Diaz either because I felt like he's always going to be a rotation with Luis Gakpo there. He, he was good short term for minutes, but I feel like in a couple of weeks it would have been an issue. And I, and I felt like with this starting 11 in particular that I would be able to bank transfers quite quickly again. Mm. There's no real rotation risks in the starting 11. No. So give me a week or two and I should have two or three transfers again. And, and when I get there, then it's easier to get back to a team structure whether Solanke or a Jackson or or you know upgrading a Semenyo so um that was the thought process behind it that I think it's it's easier to do what I did when we can mm. bank three or four transfers whereas previously maybe I would have went for a different structure okay. um in a few weeks um Salah plays uh, Brighton <laughs> um which are obviously very kind to their defenders at the moment to uh, players like Palmer and Sa and Salah um scoring wingers uh, or in Palmer's case, a bit more central at the moment. Um, do you have a plan to get Salah in? Or are you happy with Palmer and Saka? And if you did, which of Palmer and Saka would you sacrifice? Or indeed Haaland? Yeah, it's, um, there's, there isn't an immediate plan. I didn't kind of you know book in any transfers for the future. But of course, when it gets to a point where Salah's fixtures mm. are much better again... Um, it's always going to be an option. I, I I don't really see Haaland leaving at any point because his mm. fixtures are good for a while. Mm. That that was the other reason I liked the Saka Palmer midfield was yeah. a lot of people have just Saka and they're going to have to probably sell him if they want Salah. Whereas I've got the choice now. I can sell Palmer or Saka. So yeah. um, I'll, again, I'll just cross that bridge when it comes, but definitely going to probably end up back on Salah at some point. Right, yeah. Okay, um, let's have a look at, um, I've got some fixtures coming up. So this this hints on what I was just talking about in terms of looking ahead and the potential moves um, that you might make. So from game week 7 to 13, uh, Everton, Leicester, Brentford, Manchester United um, and Ipswich, uh, good fixtures, not necessarily good form in Manchester United case. Uh, Wolves as well start to get a bit better from game week 9. They've got Brighton. 
Um, and then it's a sea of blue pretty much until the new year. Uh, Man City's fixtures are really, really improved. They're, they're a bit lower down. This is just because they've got Tottenham and Liverpool in game weeks 12 and 13. Um, Arsenal fall down a bit because they've got Southampton next and Bournemouth. Great. And then they've got Liverpool, Newcastle, Chelsea. So we've seen like Gabriel in those fixtures, I would say would be a must. But um, yeah, you might think about moving Saka. Chelsea as well. Nottingham Forest up next. Um, uh, but then they've got Liverpool, Newcastle, Manchester United. That could be good now. Arsenal before they improve with Leicester and Aston Villa. So there's uh, at the same time, Liverpool's fixtures in game week 10, they've got Brighton at home, Villa at home, Southampton away. They've got a nice little run there. Um, you know, Villa, you know, arguably tough, but it's at home and Villa are conceding a lot at the moment. So the reason I ask that question is because at the same time as Chelsea and Arsenal's fixtures get a little tricky Salah's fixtures get really good and we've seen what he can do as a, as a captaincy shout uh, as well to, to, to rival uh, Haaland. Yeah, and it's this is why fixture attackers are very handy. You know, I, I'm automatically now going to have in the back of my head for the next couple of weeks, game week 10, I might want to buy Mohamed Salah. So again, that just reinforces to me, get those transfers saved up as quickly as I can to at least put me in the position to do it if I if I want to when the time comes. Yeah, I'm I'm personally looking to save this week and we'll come on to your team in a minute and other people might, especially if they've just wild carded. Um, but I might want to use one in game week eight. I might want to save one in game week nine. But game week 10, yeah, it's, it's going to be very tempting. Uh, as a Brighton fan, it's to see a high line with two of the slowest defenders in the Premier League up against players it's, it's fine when it's against Chris Wood <laughs> but when it's against Palmer and Salah that, that and I, I can't see it changing to be honest they're just no problem scoring but conceding it so was um game to target. it was insane it was insane watching the I didn't catch it live but I watched the highlights of the mm. of the Chelsea Brighton game and it was it was incredible what was happening it reminded me of Tottenham playing with nine men against yeah. Chelsea, just yeah. defending on the halfway line, getting done over and over again, and not adjusting to it. No. And I got I got four goals from Palmer, and I don't think I'm being greedy when I'm saying it should have been five or six. You know, he missed some really yeah. good chances yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah. It could have been absolutely you know record breaking stuff from. Oh, him. it could have been absolutely huge. If he'd have got six yeah. goals, that would have been, I think, the most in uh, I can remember in, in an FPL terms. Yeah, I think five is the most. I think five is the most. So six would have just, but yeah, but that that's that's the sort of level that is um, there. Um, okay. Just, see, just just before we move away from the ticker, Joe, just something mm. else. I was going back to my wild card last week. Mm. Everton top of the ticker. So mm. Mikolenko and Calvert Lewin obviously made it in. Mm. Um, but I was I went for Semenyo, like mm. many people did for the two promoted teams fixtures, but very much with an eye on McNeil mm. uh, switch then because he's cheaper. And, you know, game week eight, Semenyo's tr- uh, fixtures get really tricky. Yeah. And then McNeil's got Ipswich, Fulham, Southampton, West Ham. So uh, good to see him on the score sheet uh, with a brace. Obviously, it would have been nice to get him in on the wild card. Mm. But Semenyo's scoring a brace on Monday night anyway. So it's all going to yeah. even out. But yeah, I, Semenyo to McNeil is definitely on the cards later. I hope so um, uh, with Semenyo. It's my last hope. Um, but yeah, McNeil, good job. We mentioned him last week. So last week we were talking about team midfielders. Um, I included McNeil's stats there. You've been, you've been a fan of McNeil for some time as well. So I'm glad we did that. He did reward uh, immediate owners there. It's not actually his goal potential. It's his assist potential. But he's playing closer and closer to goal, even though they were quite long range efforts um, there. So yeah, McNeil, great, great player to have. Um, yeah, just on McNeil as well. I'm always interested to hear what ma- managers say um, after the games, and you know they asked Sean Dyche about McNeil playing more centrally, you know, and and his last couple of words was "There's more to come from him." So uh, that's wow. that's also encouraging. Definitely. Um, yeah. So uh, it, there's interesting turn of fixtures coming up. Probably less so in game week seven because six and seven were sort. Of, that's why a lot of people wild carded because it was a nice um, a couple of games. Um, but it's sort of game week eight. Um, we're looking at things like perhaps there could be some, I think, I think is it game week, game week eight after the international break? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there could be some issues with, for the likes of Diaz as well. So I personally got my eye on Diaz to um, um, a Spurs midfielder with Brennan Johnson, who scored uh, well this week in the mix there. So I'm thinking Spurs, really. Um, I've got Havertz, so I'm thinking Solanke, that kind of thing. Um, but um, yeah, I'd probably keep keep habits for for a little bit. Um, uh, okay, 
let's have a look at some defenders because so you've gone for a double um, Arsenal defence, but you you did have your eye on Gvardiol. Um, there's Lewis in the mix as well, four point seven. Lewis was the, Lewis and Gabriel was the two I I went for. Um, so you got you got this Saliba Gabriel. Um, so I've got a table up on the screen. Last four game weeks, the City defenders there. Um, I've sorted this by minutes of expected goal involvement, just on the off chance of goals. And this this is clear. Gabriel, absolute goal monster. He's got two already. Minutes per expected goal involvement, 303 minutes. That's huge for a defender. Gvardiol, similar. Th- every 328 minutes, he has scored um, as well. One goal, he created three chances. Gabriel's created two. Both similar price. Gvardiol, 5.9. I think he's gone down um, and Gabriel 6.2 um, and then Lewis uh, 4.7 one assist already created a couple of chances I minutes mean, of expected goal involvement very very much low down it's like uh, every thousand minutes which is very very poor um, and then Saliba he's absolutely nowhere in expected goal involvement no one is aiming at his head at the moment that may change but his minutes of expected goal involvement is it is every 12,000 minutes. <laughs> I can't even work that out in games. But um, that is absolutely negligible. It's so negligible. I had to make a new table for this. Because every table I made of attacking defenders, I, c- I couldn't get Saliba onto it. Even if I if I tweaked it, every way I tweaked it, I couldn't. Because his expected goal involvement was so low. He just didn't figure. I could only get to like a hundred, a list of a hundred. So... So I had to just make a new table and just <laughs> and just include him in there. Um, so that's how, yeah. So anyway, they're the stats. You've, made, you've got your decision at the moment, but you're looking to, to perhaps tweak that and improve your team. Yeah, so again, going back to wildcard tinkering, I was on David Raya all week last week, like many people were. I caught yep. the price right. So I didn't get rid of him until Saturday morning. And... Instead of going down the Havertz approach, I was never going to afford that because I wanted Palmer. So it was still, mm-hmm. I still, it was either just get two Arsenal players, keep the door open for David Raya, or go all in on triple. And looking at the, the upcoming two fixtures, including last week, it made sense to still go triple Arsenal. Um, so, but on Saturday morning, about half 10, I I plugged Gavardi all in for the first time. Didn't really tinker with him at all mm-hmm. last week. I'd played around with Lewis like many people did. Put Gvardiol in. I says, could I go Gvardiol instead of Saliba? Because Man City's fixtures are better long term. Mm. And I kept coming back to just get double Arsenal defence for the next two fixtures, try and get two clean sheets, mm. and then look at it later. So going forward, maybe not this week, but the week after, who would I rather own, Saliba or Gvardiol? And wow. I think it's Gvardiol. Mm. And, you know, he was on the score sheet again. But most most notably for me, again, Match of the Day did a very good analysis on the corner routines in the Arsenal game at the weekend. And it's it's in, it's crazy how little goal threat Saliba has from corners because he just goes in on the goal line, kind mm. of occupies a defender and a goalkeeper, and they just make as much space as possible for Gabriel. Mm. It's just Gabriel is the only player basically attacking an yeah. Arsenal corner. Yeah. So when you think of that, your ceiling for Saliba is probably six points. Unless he gets really lucky and a corner falls nicely to him or he gets mm-hmm. a, you know, a flick on from a Gabriel header or something like that. Overall, who's got the higher ceiling, Saliba or Gvardiol? And it's definitely Gvardiol. Yeah. Um, so again, going to try and save a few transfers. But again, if you look at the fixtures in a couple of weeks, Arsenal, when they go into Liverpool, Newcastle, Chelsea... Vardio will have Southampton, Bournemouth, mm. Brighton. Yeah. Now, I know which player I'd rather own at that point. Yeah. So, again, if I can be in a luxurious mm. position, I will make that move. And then, again, that maybe opens the door for David Raya later mm. or Havertz. If Flecken, which probably will happen, gets one or two points every week for the next few weeks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the other the other option, you have got Lewis as well. So, if you wanted, if you didn't, if you wanted to move Saliba down to Lewis, then you've got a million or so in the bank saved and you can pile that into... Perhaps even getting a Pedro um, up front uh, give you an option there. It can also uh, bump up one of the cheaper midfielders to a 6.5, a sort of Matoma. Uh, we talk about Brian's defence, but their attack's still good. They still scored two in that in that uh, goal fest. Um, so it gives you it gives you more options there. But obviously Gvardiol would be the main one. But there, but but it, it's um, it's a good position to be in. I think having Saliba 
even though you're not happy with him, in that it's who he can move to. And you've got a couple yeah. of good options here. Yeah, hopefully a clean sheet from him in game week seven. And then, likewise, I don't think he'll be there long term. Yeah. And I'm still very, very interested in Rico Lewis. I know mm. a lot of wild carders went there. Mm. And again, watching the game, the positions he gets into is incredible now. He's really, really high in attacks. So there's going to be attacking returns mm. there. He's just going to fall into attacking returns. I think if myself mm. or yourself, Joe, were playing in Rico Lewis's position for Manchester City, we'd probably uh, back ourselves to get something in terms yeah, of FPL points. Definitely. And again, it's the the <laughs> price is very the price is very attractive. I've part of my thinking as well was. In the future, I might go Saliba to Guardiola, but I also thought mm. I might go Saliba to Lewis at some point, and I've got Mikalenko in place mm. for the kind of lewis yeah, Mikalenko double what... up the back up the fixtures. Um, and yeah, like you said, you mentioned a few upgrades. Is that's possible if I get Lewis mm. for, for Saliba later? And certainly on my mind would be uh, Calvert-Lewin if he doesn't do what we want him mm-hmm. to do. You know, Solanke at some point. Yeah. It's not a you're not a million miles away from him then. Yeah. So yeah, everything's kind of. Everything's kind of flexible here. I'm, I'm going to throw another name into the mix as well. Um, <clears throat> he was a name that was actually on my wildcard draft that I showed last week. I didn't go for him. I went for the Rico Lewis, Mikolenko. I, I quite like that double up because you've got the, got the, got a backup um, there. But it was uh, Mickey van der Ven at Spurs. Um, now, I actually had him, um, even if I'd have gone for him, I'd have perhaps been even more frustrated because I definitely would have benched him because concert I would have played. I had a Conser van der Ven double up. They they dovetail quite nicely. And um, yeah, so I would have sat there with 11 points on my bench, which would be very annoying. But nevertheless, I'm glad I've recommended him as a player because one thing I liked was exactly what he did. Very, It's not, it's not every match, but occasionally he just, he just comes out of defence and just runs and runs and runs. And for some reason, probably because he, I don't know, he's six foot five or six foot four. They, I don't think um, defences know what to do with him. And then he just, what he did, he just set up Brennan Johnson's goal, which was, you know, an easy goal in the end. But it was, the assist was phenomenal for a centre-back. Um, I, I would I would recommend him because Tottenham, um, well, game week seven, they got Brighton, but then they got West Ham, Crystal Palace, Aston Villa, Ipswich. And then they do have City in game week 12, so you need to back up them. Then Fulham at home, game week 13. I, I mean, I still have him in in my thoughts. If I if I if Rico Lewis becomes a problem, or Mikalenko becomes a problem, I, I, he's top of my list. <laughs> yeah, Van de Ven should probably be five million. Um, yeah, you know, four point five is a very kind price, and he's. I, I liked uh, Planet FPL James's post yesterday. He says, "Don't get overexcited. We're, it's not going. We're not going to be playing Manchester United every week." So uh, <laughs> that was a, a dagger when when I was already down, but. Uh, <laughs> I think he does have a point, though. You know, it's Tottenham historically under Postal Cogley. They don't keep too many clean sheets. No. Um, but on the flip side, I don't think any other defender in the Premier League can get that assist that Van de Ven did. It was one of the best assists yeah. I've ever seen that's, from that's, a defender. But it's the second time I've seen him do it this season. Yeah. We've only, we're only six games in. He's an absolute monster. And there, if he keeps doing that, he's going to pull the trigger sometimes himself as well. Yeah. You know, and there, there could be goals to come. And, and not just that, you mentioned his... He's he's a monster himself. Mm. So he's obviously he's he's a threat from corners and set yeah. pieces as well uh, with his yeah. head. So yeah, I, I underpriced I think, mm. and again maybe better in a rotation, which a lot of people are doing, yeah. uh, and maybe maybe with a with a Rico Lewis for example. Yeah. But yeah, he's a uh, he certainly caught the eye. He's just such a good player, yeah. such a good player. Um, I mean, yeah, just my my experience of thinking about him in a rotation that shows the the problem though with that. When you come up to the team where you think, oh, Manchester United away, I'm not going to get much there. And 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 the other player, in this case, a Villa defender at Ipswich, you think it's going to get better. But um, yeah, that's the problem with rotation. So arguably it could be played any week. Um, but there are problems there because, as you said, Spurs don't keep that many um, clean sheets. Um, let's have a look at forwards as well. So cheap forwards. So you mentioned you've got Calvert-Lewin. I've got Chris Wood in my team. Um, I'm actually OK with Chris Wood myself. For a while, got um, he's got Chelsea away <laughs> against Robert Sanchez, but I'm probably going to bench him anyway this week. Crystal Palace, um, Leicester, West Ham, and Newcastle coming up, so that's good for Chris Wood. Everton, good as well. Calvert Lewin's got Newcastle, Ipswich, Fulham, Southampton, West Ham. So these are the, I mean, that's my team. Calvert Lewin's in your team as well. Um, you mentioned Pedro and Kuna in your notes to me. 
as potentials. Uh, and just to mention Wolves fixtures, they do have City in game week eight, but afterwards they've got Brighton, Crystal Palace, Southampton, Fulham and Bournemouth. And they've indeed got Brentford up next. Um, and Brighton's fixtures are absolutely terrible until game week 12 when they have Bournemouth, Southampton and a quite a nice run from there. And um, yeah, obviously what happened with Brighton, it's uh, if Pedro's fit, their attack's not a problem. <laughs> So I've, I've flagged them up. But before we look at some of those other names, yeah, what is your general thoughts about strikers at the moment in, in your team? Yeah, so I went for kind of unconventional uh, 4.5 forward and then really expensive and really cheap with Haaland and Calvert-Lewin. So again, structure-wise, it's it's not ideal because it's very hard to get to work in Solanke, Jackson, etc. Mm. But I just feel, you know, a lot of teams now have Chris Wood or Calvert-Lewin. Some teams have both. Yeah. And especially people who've wildcarded, your team is really strong now and but give it a couple of weeks if either or of those cheap strikers don't deliver mm. i think it's good to have an idea of what's what our options are elsewhere mm -hmm. uh, and in particular there's, there's there's a few emerging that are cheaper that could free up funds for for other positions so i thought it'd be good to look at some of these today yeah definitely i mean for example like um so i've got habits some people have got solanke so he's got sort of solanke habits harland and a Calvert-Lewin or uh, Chris Wood. Um, but yeah, you can move that Havertz or Solanke actually down <laughs> to a cheaper defense, uh, striker and then use that money in midfield um, or use that money in defence as well. So um, there are plenty of options there. Um, and there's plenty of options here. So uh, the first name on the list, so I've sorted this by minutes per expected goal involvement last four game weeks. And it's Duran, no starts <laughs> at Aston Villa. But he's he's got a goal involvement every 81 minutes. Um, he's got three goals. I mean, he is the most super sub I've in that I can recall. Um, he's the new Solskjaer. But no, no one's going to get him in, are they? <laughs> yeah, the new Solskjaer. Yeah. So, but no one will get him in because of those starts. But no other no other striker in this list has got more than three goals. There's a few who have got three goals, but no one's got more than him. Yeah, it's it's a it's a funny one, Duran, because he's I think it's quite clear to see that he's incredibly good and <laughs> he's just gonna struggle to get a run of starts. I don't really see Emery going down the route of playing him and Watkins. I know he's done it for a wee while off the bench, but I don't I think it's gonna take a lot for him to start both. Mm. Uh, you know, just with the systems he uses and, and stuff like that. I think he prefers he probably likes Duran as an impact mm. because he know he's shown him what he can do. Wow. And you know, if you're a defender with twenty minutes to go and you're already tired, you do not want to see Duran mm. coming off the bench to, no. to, to play against you. So but yeah, FPL wise, Duran is still a no go. Um, if you're looking for a Villa forward, it's got to be Watkins. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we will completely continue ignore him. I will continue to do tables like this, and he will continue to be top. <laughs> So there we go. Um, Avinilson at Bournemouth, 5.9. Now, he's new to us. We don't have that pedigree where we think, oh, Calvert Lewin, we've seen him score maybe the seasons. Chris Wood, we've seen him score for like every team over the last 10 years. Um, but this new new striker at Bournemouth, no goals, but his minutes of expected goal involvement is just behind Duran in this list every 133 minutes. And he does have three starts, but only one shot on target. So I don't know what to make of him at all. We'll, we're recording this before Bournemouth play Southampton. This is a good ch another good chance to have a look at him because he could be an option. Yeah, big big audition Monday night for Ivan Nielsen, and mm. he's in my he's in my draft team. So I'm hoping he uh, he arrives in the Premier League on on Monday night, and certainly don't get a better fixture to do so. Mm. But again, it's just we just don't have enough information yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, if you can do well against Southampton and back that up with another, you know, performance or two, mm -hmm. then again down the line, if we need, if we need an alternative forward, then then he could emerge. Um, okay. I, I certainly like what I've seen of him. I know he hasn't scored yet, but um, he's taking all the other boxes yeah. for me. Um, Jimenez has now replaced Muniz as the first, the top striker at Fulham, um, and he's really made the most of it as well. It's eight shots on target, which is huge, which is most out of any on this list. He's now had four starts in his last four game weeks. Created a couple of chances, two goals and an assist. That's three returns. I'm um, sorry, uh, sorry, three goals rather for Jimenez. So I was looking at Calvert Lewin's there. So eight shots on target, yet yeah, three goals. Created a couple of chances, five point five. We'll all ignore him as well, but because we all, in the back of our minds, we're thinking mm, Muniz is there. Muniz can come in. Jimenez, uh, he'll play into. I don't know if he plays internationals anymore, but um, 
he um we just think he might get um rotated but we'll all, another good player we're going to ignore yeah there's there's probably just enough negatives not to go there mm. you're, you're thinking even if he does keep getting starts it could be 70 minute appearances with with a very good striker when he's behind him he took a penalty but i, I i've seen a few reports to, to suggest maybe andres Pereira would have taken the penalty but he was crocked because he won the penalty i think he oh, right. hurt his ankle or something right. so you know don't don't 100 percent rely okay. on him and it's been mm. a penalty taker there might there might there might be something there but yeah looking good and again if he keeps getting starts, then then we probably will have to look at him at some point. Definitely. Um, Calvert Lewin's next. Um, yeah, an assist and and two goals. So that's three three return attacking returns. Four four starts. He seems to be fit again. We haven't often we often said over the last couple of seasons I'd get Calvert Lewin if he was fit. <clears throat> well, he now is, um, and now their attack seems to be gelling. They got McNeil there. We we've, we've spoken about. Um, yeah, he got a blank for you and and for the fellow owners. In game week six, I, I wouldn't be in a rush to sell him though. Nah, there's no concerns. It was a, you know, a long term wild card pick. Mm. It's one of those where, again, my number one priority is to save as many transfers as quickly as possible. And a player like Calvert Lewin, as long as he stays fit, you're you never need to sell him mm. because the fixtures are always there, mm. and the points potential is always there. Something I try and think about as well is, you know, what price is my player? And that's the the points I want to get from him often. So Calvert Lewin six million. Mm. Can I get six points from him often? And and you certainly can with a striker. So uh, yeah, he's as long as he stays fit, underlined capital letters. Yeah, he will be. He'll be there for a while, I think. Yeah. Um, I think Calvert Lewin owners won't move to Chris Wood. I think they've already made their choice there. So I made the Chris Wood choice. You've done the Calvert Lewin one. Um, so it's perhaps other strikers we're looking at here. But it's worth mentioning Chris Wood last four game weeks, two goals. He has created a chance. Five shots on target. Um, started all four. A one he has come back into the fold, but he's playing w- alongside in the same team as Chris Wood. So Chris Wood is clearly absolutely favoured. I think he lasted the full 90 minutes um, in the last game or certainly beyond his Pretty usual. Sure. Yeah. I think a one you came off at half time. So. Yes, yeah. So Chris Wood is still clearly the favoured one there, and as I mentioned, the fixtures um, is up against um, looking at Nottingham Forest. Yeah, Chelsea, uh, I'd say Chelsea, but you got to think that he's up against Sanchez. <laughs> so think think on that, and that's why I'm expecting some bench points if I bench him this week. Um, but some good good strong fixtures until sort of Arsenal game week twelve. But then you've got to switch at home game week thirteen. Very rotatable, um, yeah. I mean, I yeah. I'm same with you with Calvert Lewin. I've got Chris Wood. I'm fine. Um, next name, Welbeck, five point eight. Um, he has a goal over his last uh, four game weeks as well. But the fixtures are absolutely terrible. So I'll probably just sort of skirt over him. You're just not interested. Yeah, just fixtures yeah. just rules yeah, him yeah, out. Yeah, okay. Um, Eddie Nketiah as ha- has hat trick form with Arsenal now at Crystal Palace. Um, one to I'm I'm just keep, I don't know if he's on your watch list. I'm I'm cert, he's certainly on on mine, as in like I'm you know not that I particularly want to get him, but I'm in, I'm intrigued. Yeah, I, I don't think I need to redo my watch list now after the after the wild card. I'll do that this week. But the 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 issue's not in Ketia. Yeah, we know he's good. The issue is Crystal Palace. And mm. again, going back to manager yeah. comments after the games at the weekend. Uh, Palace manager was basically saying, you know, maybe this is just back to reality. Yeah. You know, uh, how difficult the Premier League is. You know, yeah, yes, we had a really good mm. end to last season, but it was that comment stuck out to me, back to reality. So yeah. um, all is not going swimmingly at the moment, yeah. Crystal Palace-wise. I still like Eze, yeah. uh, and I think I'll go there first. But um, yeah, it's, it's going to take a bit more for me to go to yeah. Inketia or, or Mateta. Yeah. Um, Ipswich de Lapp, um got... Got a handsome return in game week six. Um, three goals so far for Ipswich. It just shows that he is the main goal. I mean, in, in terms of goal involvement, um, I still think Leif Davis is is the one if you want to get some involvement there. Um, but with Ipswich not keeping clean sheets to lap, 5.5. You've got, um, yeah, you, you could save a bit of money, for example. If Cavalloon gets injured, um, with Ipswich's fixtures, West Ham, Everton, Brentford, Leicester, Next, next four. Um, if Cavalier was injured and you needed to save a bit of money, I don't think you can go do worse than to that. You can play him every week. 
the lap the lap might actually be the best theme on this list <laughs> aside from calvert lewin and chris wood and one of the reasons I, I wanted to talk about the forwards today particularly these guys like 5.5 mm. Jimenez isn't the laps mm. because what you're going to have this week is a lot of people who don't have erling Haaland is going into really good fixtures mm. Uh, Cole Palmer, people might want to just jump on now regardless of fixtures. So mm. people who have a couple of transfers or, or maybe even wild cards in Game 7 that they just want to make changes and you might need really cheap enablers. Yeah. So people like the lap, I think the lap's probably done enough now to, to show that he's, he's, he's a viable option. Yeah. Um, uh, very, very famous, very famous father, uh, yeah. uh, Rory the lap with his, yeah. with his long throws uh, yeah. of, of Stoke City fame. Um, so yeah, Really, just he, I'm pretty sure he was in Manchester City for a long time. So we know this guy is is really he, he's got pedigree, yeah. And he's he's showing it now. The goal in particular, where he he basically sent Diego Carlos for a for a kebab uh, <laughs> and then stuck the ball in the back of the net was really really impressive. So uh, yeah, five point five looking good. Yeah, um, a few more names left to go through before we look at your game week seven team. Um, Joe Pedro injured at the moment. Um, he does have a goal. He is on penalties. Um, in the last four game weeks, this is he's 5.6. He'll go down in price um, because he's quite well owned relatively for this price range. But as I said, it's game week 12 onwards. He's going to be popular. So that's why I flagged him up in, in, in blue on this list because I'm and I've got Kuna as well at 6.5. He's created six chances. He does have a goal in his last four. He's always looked good. Um, and in terms of minutes per baseline bonus, uh, Pedro and Kuna are the, are the main men on here and, and die a bit further down for Everton. Um, they're getting a baseline bonus. This is what you get instead of instead of just scoring, um, you know, it's just the jobbing stuff they do to rack up bonus. I'd flag them up because it's sort of game week 10, 11, 12. There's going to be start to be interest in these two. And you're going to see content creators mentioning them, their names a lot. And they're different prices and people might be faced with a choice there. Um, but yeah, I mean, can you see, I mean, I've got Kuna basically penciled in at some point around that time. If you look at this list of forwards and you forget about FPL and you ask me who is mm. the best, you know, footballer mm. in this list, and I would say it's definitely Kuna. Yeah. So we, we, we said it from the, from day one, they've had ridiculously tricky fixtures from game week mm. one right the way through and still a few more to go. But once they clear up, Mm. then Cunha is is going to be near the top of my list when it comes to forwards as well. You know, maybe, you know, I ride out the Calvert Loon fixtures for, for quite a while, four, five, six weeks. And then by that point, Cunha will have a better run. And mm -hmm. he's got, I think he's got plenty of roots to points. He's quite creative. He links the play well. He's even been taking a few corners. I know some of them are probably short corners, but, you know, he's he's involved in those as mm -hmm. well. Uh, just a really good player. And yeah. and I fully expect to own Cunha at some point this season. Yeah, I mean, game week nine, Havertz to Cunha is something I'm seriously considering because Cunha's got Brighton away then. Um, and that's when the good run starts. So um, that that's a, a possibility because Havertz has got then got less uh, Liverpool um, that week. So it's just um, that's, that's something to consider. I think for those with yeah. Solanke, that's more tricky. So they were perhaps thinking of their Calvert Lewin moving to Kuna, perhaps. Um, yeah, that but... that I think that would suit my. Stro I mean, yeah. again, I'm just looking at these the, the fixture checker for Wills. Game week nine looks like the entry point. Mm. Brighton away yeah. for Kuna, Palace home, Southampton mm. home, Fulham away, Bournemouth home. That yeah. that yeah. seems good. Um, okay, um, I'll rattle through these because we want to get to your team. Um, Antonio, I don't think we're going to go there um, for West Ham. West Ham just look like a bit of a mess at the moment, and I'll probably go for Bowen myself. Um, uh, Vardy, okay, I'm, I'm just to dwell on him. Four starts. I mean, he's, I don't even know how old he is now, but yeah, he has. He's getting re he's getting returns at five point seven. He's not too bad, um, but he's probably low down on my list. Yeah, but as long as he's fit, he's he's always going to be viable. So if you if you can't afford a Chris Wood or a, a Calvert Lewin, then I don't I don't mind Vardy at all. Okay, uh, and Dyer Everton, um, uh, five chances created there. He's playing out on the wing. He was great at Sheffield United, um, but I think he's uh, he's you've sort of got McNeil, Calvert Lewin, and Dyer. He's just third choice, isn't he? And once you get down to third choice, who's going to have a triple Everton attack? Unless you're a massive Everton fan. Yeah, and Dyes looked really good, but the fact that he, he has played wide quite a lot, he'd be an option if there was no such thing yeah. as a Calvert Lewin. But yeah. Calvert Lewin's there, McNeil's probably the best Everton option, and then you've got a 4.3 Michalenko, okay. so there's no space for Indy. 
Yeah. Um, it's worth noting that he he and Pedro are the best at baseline bonus. So if he were to score or get an attack in return, there's very, very strong chance of bonus there. Um, and Strand Larson's next at 5.5, who some might go for. He has had four starts, just a couple of shots on target, has got an assist. Um, but if you can't quite get to Kuna and you, and you are keen on the Wolves attack, Strand Larson could be quite a good player just to just to plug in and, and you can, you've got a cheap striker there with great fixtures from Game Week 9 onwards. Yeah, I like what I've seen of Strand Larson this season. I think he's quite a useful forward up front for Wills. Mm. Uh, and again, 1 million saving over Cunha is significant. You know, I always think that's two upgrades with 0. Yeah. 0.5 in two different spots. Yeah. Uh, but again, I think it's worth, at the moment, on current info, uh, spend the extra million on Cunha. Okay, uh, let's move on to your Game Week 7 side. So do you want to read out the team, who you're captaining, any potential moves or, or if you're saving why are you saving yeah so I'll just read it out first of all I've got uh, Gianluigi Buffon in goal also known as Flecken at mm-hmm. Brentford I've got Trent Saliba Gabriel at the back which feels secure Cole Palmer Saka Semenyo who plays Leicester in Bumo and Rodgers up against Manchester United which is a very good mm-hmm. fixture Calvert-Lewin and current captain is Erling Haaland mm-hmm. on the bench Mikalenko Greaves and Leon Chiawomi okay the plan is bank a transfer, which I always try and do the week after a wild card. There's no injuries, there's no suspensions. Hopefully, everything is okay midweek in Europe and all the rest. Team looks fine. Probably the only consideration for me is the armband. I, I've got it on Haaland at home to Fulham. Looks very, very obvious. But part of me is very tempted by Cole Palmer because of what he's just done. Mm. I also like the idea that a lot of people won't buy him even though he's just got 25 yeah, points because I, I won't yeah fixtures number one uh team structure it's really hard to get there because you're not going to sell Saka to get the Palmer because he's got Southampton at home so do I do I double down on my Palmer selection do I captain him against Forrest which I think is fine I know they've, they've got good defensive numbers but I think Palmer's attacking prowess you know, trumps any any defence at the moment. Uh, I know it's not a Brighton defence, mm. which probably plays a big part in the in the 25-pointer. So I, I think it's a very close call for me, Haaland versus Palmer for captaincy. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I'm just, while we're here, I'm just quickly, and I hope this is going to be quick, um, looking at the team stats for defending, because my instinct is to say there's a big difference in Brighton and Nottingham Forest defence. So I will do all matches... Um, and expected goals conceded. Um, yeah, Brighton are one of the worst, but not as, not the worst, but they're getting there. So their expected goals conceded is 10, but they have conceded eight um, over their last, um, over, 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 the, over the six matches so far. Um, but Nottingham Forest are... Well, can you guess where they are in the table? Bearing in mind Brighton are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, are the uh, seventh worst. So, where do you think Nottingham Forest would be in the table? Defensively, they could be. They could be top five. They are indeed. They're top three. Yeah. <laughs> my ear, my my uh, my earpiece dropped out in shock. Uh, the top the top defense is Liverpool. Um, expected goals conceded um, four point five. Man City five point two five four rather. Nottingham Forest 5.38. So the reason I highlight that is Nottingham Forest are a very, very different um, team to Brighton defensively. Yeah, but again, Hmm. I'm probably looking at it more as player versus player, Alan versus Palmer. And yeah. If you th- again, I still and I probably still do it myself. Even though I picked them, I still mm. probably underrate them. Paul Palmer, mm. especially when I, I mm. remember doing my season review, season review uh, at the end of last season, and I only captained Cole Palmer twice. And I remember thinking that is something I need to improve on next season because mm-hmm. this guy is just incredible. You know, in my mind, he's the new Salah of FPL. So okay. if he's the new Salah in my mind, yeah. why am I not captaining him more often? Look at the points so far this season. Erling Haaland, I think, is on sixty five. Uh, Cole Palmer is now on 61. There's not much in it. Uh, you know, Palmer gets a clean sheet point if they keep one. He gets an extra point for a goal. And he's got more roots to points. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm i very much giving it a lot of thought. Yeah, and no, I might end up there. No, it definitely is. I mean, it's a, it's a good fixture. But um, it was just more, I believe, 
from just looking at the difference between Brighton and Nottingham Forest as well. Fulham as well um, are actually pretty good defence. So that does put you back in the Palmer thing. So if we think um, Nottingham Forest defence is good, uh, Fulham have only conceded five goals and the expected goals conceded 6.58. That makes them better than the Arsenal defence, which we've all just doubled up on. Um, yeah. Part of my thinking as well is, um, you know, I don't I don't really play analytically, but I, mm. I listen to podcasts that do and I, and I keep an eye on what they're doing. And they, they often talk about where if you've got a close decision, mm. for example, on a captaincy, you know, maybe go for the differential on, on that, oh, you know, the, the okay. one that's going to have lower lower ownership. Because I've got Haaland anyway. Mm. If he goes massive, at least I've got, the you know, 50% of the points if I don't captain him. Yeah. And, you know, where where's the biggest gain? You know, what's going to what's going to gain me more? Um a Haaland hat trick or a Palmer hat trick, you know, if the other is is quieter, mm. and I think it's the Palmer. Yeah. So that's that's part of the thought process there. Yeah, and also there's um, with Rodri out, um, that sort of discombobulates Man City a little. So yeah, we don't, just, we don't quite yeah, know. Yeah. I love the fact that Palmer, you know, gets get mid week mid weeks off as well. He's mm. always fresh. And yeah. So yeah, it's yeah, I'm a big obviously I'm a big Palmer fan after what he's just done. Right. But you got me worried now. <laughs> so uh, uh, let's let's hope his ownership's low. But yeah, there could be quite a few um, captaincies uh, for him now, especially after getting four goals. Um, but yeah, I can I can. A bit say- harsh there that I didn't mention Saka for the captaincy. There he's home to Southampton. You know? uh, yeah, Southampton go and concede a few to to Bournemouth Monday night. Then I'm going to have to consider him as well. Yeah, the, th- the thing about Saka, he's reliable and he does have a high ceiling. And he, but he has a really good floor. <laughs> If he was a carpet fitter, he would have the best floor um, because you, he just gets, he even got, well, it was two of his bonus were taken away. He even got bonus with no attacking returns and That's it was close. looking like he was going to get maximum. So he's very close. And so that, you know, he's, yeah, he's got a gleaming, shiny marble floor <laughs> at the moment. Um, okay. Thanks so much for joining me, uh, Mark. Uh, good luck with the game week. Um, and um Let's hope I do better. <laughs> so next next week uh, we can both have nice shiny green arrows. Hopefully, uh, I'll probably I'll, I'll I'll plummet so low that I'll probably more easily get a green arrow. Um, but um, okay, good luck with the game week. Good luck, everyone. Thanks for watching. Um, do leave a comment below who you're getting in, perhaps who your transfer is, and who you're captaining. Uh, remember to press that like button. Remember to subscribe. Take care. See you soon. Bye bye.